Hey everyone, welcome back to Design Create Inspire. Thank you for spending another week with me. Today, I am talking all about sustainability and specifically how you as a designer or an architect or maybe even a homeowner, if you are working with a designer or architect, can make your project more sustainable. Now, sustainability comes in so many different forms. It's, you know, how you as an occupant uses a space or the occupants that inhabit the space you design um, use the space. It's, you know, how you live your everyday life. It's about materials you choose. It's about energy use. It's all these things. So there's so much that goes into sustainability that, um, you know, you could have an entire YouTube channel or podcast specifically on sustainability. So I'm only going to go over like a nugget of it, but one that you can be thinking of as you are designing. And this isn't just for architects, this is also for interior designers. It's um, really designers, anyone who's going to be part of the process of building, designing a home. Let's get into it. Okay, so the four ways to make your project more sustainable we are talking about efficiency, longevity, healthy environments, and low environmental impact. So again, there's so many different ways that you can go about this, but these are four specific ways that you can work on from the very beginning of your design concepts in order to make your project more sustainable. So first, let's talk about efficiency. I'm a huge advocate of efficiency. And when I talk about efficiency, I'm not just talking about your lighting or energy use or that sort of efficiency that often people are thinking about. I'm talking about your floor plan. I'm talking about your use of space. There's so much about efficiency that goes into it that then later affects things like energy use or you know, thermal comfort, all those things. Energy efficiency is one way, and this is when you use less energy to perform the same task than you would otherwise. It's also eliminating energy waste, so things just being on and wasting energy. <laughs> so there's many ways that you can go about this, like passive design, where your space is utilizing passive elements, meaning you're not using mechanical or electrical elements. So we we're talking sunlight, wind, natural features around a space in order to capitalize on those elements like lighting in order to reduce items like electrical lighting and mechanical use and all that stuff. So that is what we're talking about with efficiency in terms of energy. And that is definitely a huge one when we're talking about efficiency. Of course, lighting is a really big expense in buildings, and it's also a really big contributor to heat. And so if you have a lot of lighting that is contributing to heat, and say it's a hot summer day, and now your building is even more hot, because you have all this added lighting, now that's increasing the loads of our mechanical equipment in order to combat that light in order to cool it. So it becomes this like cycle of you're trying to light the space because it's too dark, and then you're trying to cool the space because it's too hot because you're lighting the space, and it's this cycle of increasing all of these systems. So if we can create a more passive interior where we're utilizing the sunlight so we're not having to turn on the lights. We're utilizing cross ventilation so we aren't having to increase the AC. All those things are gonna reduce not only the, the load of these, these items on um, you know, the environment, but also the price of your bills. So it's a win-win essentially. 
So that is the energy efficiency side of efficiency. But then there's the design side of efficiency, which is what I really love to work with from the very beginning. So when I'm looking at a floor plan, I really want to make sure that I am designing efficiently. And it starts to become um, kind of like a Tetris, like a, a game. How can we design the most efficiently? And traditionally, you can envision like a McMansion or a suburban home that's really big and how it's not necessarily an efficient use of space for the use, you know, for a family of four, it might not be what is necessarily needed. And so design efficiency is essentially designing for what is needed, not in excess. So we're not just designing excessive spaces just to design them. And it's eliminating wasted space. So we're, we try to eliminate things like hallways and all that kind of stuff. Envision like those McMansions, not necessarily the most efficient use of space. And reduced space, why is this important? This is important because not only does this create less demand on our mechanical and electrical systems, which again goes back to that energy efficiency, but it also reduces the amount of materials that are needed. It also reduces the, the footprint of a building. So we have more outdoor space and more natural land around the building. So all of those things tie in. I also think that there's a psychological benefit of having things be efficient. There's not a bunch of added space to add clutter or have to fill. There's this universal law where the vacuum. So if you have an open space, something's going to fill it. And so if you have this big inefficient floor plan, something's going to fill it, whether it's furniture or clutter or whatever it is. And so having a more efficient space in turn helps save you money and creates a more zen-like space, essentially. And that kind of ties into this next concept of efficiency is minimalism. Now, I know not everyone's minimalist, and that's fine. And what I think is the most important for this term minimalism is it doesn't have to necessarily mean stark, not cozy, cold, all those things. That's not what it means. And I have a whole episode all about minimalism. I also have this awesome minimalist guide for you that you can go check out. Um, I'll put a link in down below because I don't know the link off the top of my head, but I'll put a link down below if you are interested. It's a um, like a 30-day guide to minimalism. And what is really important that I stress is that you can have the same bold colors and green walls and green couches like I do and still live this minimalist life. But what this means is you're designing for what is needed. Again, like the design efficiency, you are not going in excess. And the minimalism that I refer to and that I'm a big proponent of, it's just reducing the waste and the clutter. So it doesn't have to mean that you don't have any tchotchkes or whatever. It just means that you're reducing waste, you're reducing clutter, you're reducing unnecessary consumerism and you have this philosophy that less is more. So yeah, you maybe buy something that you're really passionate about, some piece of artwork or a figurine or something, and you can spend a little bit more money on it because you're buying one that is meaningful to you versus going to you know, maybe a big box store every weekend and just buying things to buy them. So Minimalism doesn't have to mean boring or monochromatic or not personable. It just means decrease clutter and intention, intention with what you buy and what you put in your space. There's a lot that goes into how this affects your sustainability, not only because of purchasing new materials and new products and new things and and being part of that consumerist culture, 
but it also means that you have a healthier environment on your interior because you don't have as much dust, you don't have um, clutter, which psychologically can affect you. And so it in turn leads to a healthier occupant environment and behavior. So there's so much that goes into minimalism and how it provides a sustainable interior or building and in ways that you might not even think about. So energy efficiency, again, this can come into so many different aspects of a project. And especially if you're working on like commercial buildings, this is super important. So I think efficiency is the easiest way to get started with sustainability where it's literally at the first sketch that you're thinking about efficiency. And it's easier um, to propose for clients if you are an architect or an interior designer because you're not having to spend more money in order to start with this. You're actually reducing money, you're reducing building material, you're reducing square footage, all that kind of stuff. It's a great way to essentially get the ball started in sustainability. Now, the second one I'm going to talk about is longevity. This is essentially the long-term impact on materials or of materials. And this is really important, especially for interior designers, because typically you will be specking the most materials. So yes, architects as well, we wanna make sure that there's longevity in the building materials that we're specking, the roofing, the exterior materials, how are our, our facades or, or our exterior shells going to be holding up? Those are all super important. But as we go inside and into a space, we wanna make sure that the building materials or the interior materials that we're specifying have longevity. Like what are these products made up of? What is their life cycle like? What does that look like? And then even what is the harvesting manufacturing process of these materials? Because there is a embodied energy that goes into making a material that can add to the sustainability or not sustainability of a product. And typically you can find this information either through the manufacturer or through just the understanding of things like steel versus concrete and what that embodied energy is, what that lifetime cycle is, and all that kind of stuff. Life cycle of a material, there's two concepts with this. And if you are an architect or an interior designer, you likely know these, but I want to just dive into it a little bit because they are important. You have this cradle to cradle concept for a life cycle. You also have cradle to grave. Now, a cradle to grave is like what we typically see in a lot of things. uh, And really within the last couple of years or decades, the last decade or two, um, we started seeing more cradle to cradle, but Cradle to grave is like what you would see going into a landfill. So something that is created and then goes through its life and then goes to the grave and is done. Cradle to cradle is something that can be produced, go through its life cycle, and then be recycled or reused into something else. I know we all hear about recycling, so this is kind of essentially that concept is that cradle to cradle. Now, it's interesting with recycling because, I don't know, you hear reports that like only 5% of plastics are actually recycled and, and you know, so the whole concept of recycling, you kind of have to look a little bit deeper into and see what really, you know, how is that really accurate or real in what you're using or what you're specking. But this day and age, there are a lot of really cool products that are recycled. Um, that have used plastic or have used other denim, stuff like that, that you can then incorporate into your products. So looking at the life cycle of materials is an important one in terms of the longevity um, and not just that life cycle analysis, but also the durability of them. And there are certain third-party like assessments or 
yeah, essentially assessments of products. So you could look for stuff like that. Like there's cradle to cradle, there's environmentally preferred products. Uh, there is environmentally environmental product declaration. And then there's also a smart certified product. So different certifications, there's more than that too, but those are some of, you know, some of them that you can look into and you can kind of get an idea of if it has a good life cycle assessment or one at all. The other thing with longevity is appliances. So appliances are huge for interior efficiency. I would say that most are kind of geared towards energy efficiency these days, but those can be a really big suck of energy in a space. And so making sure that you are specifying something that has a good energy rating is really important. And there has been a lot of improvements to stuff like washing machines and um, refrigerators and dishwashers and, and stuff like that. It's a lot easier to find these days, but definitely you want to make sure that this is something that you as a client or you to your client are showing the importance because you don't want to skimp on something because maybe it's a little bit less expensive because in the long run, it's going to be way more expensive. A more energy efficient appliance is going to be much more cost saving in the long run. So you always want to make sure that you're looking at the whole picture rather than just the initial price tag. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about healthy environments. Now, this is really critical for interior designers because you are going to be the ones who are specifying a lot of those interior furniture and artwork and finishes and fabrics that will really affect that healthy environment. But it's also something as architects, we have to understand the no or low VOCs and, you know, what, what carpets maybe we're specifying or, you know, interior flooring, um, that sort of thing. Now, this day and age, we do have, and especially here in California, we have pretty strict rules with environmental requirements. And so a lot of it is already kind of set up for our success, but these are just areas that are important to know anyways, and you can always kind of stay, take it one step further if you want. So with healthy environments, the first thing that I want to mention is essentially furniture and products that come from sources that promote safe manufacturing processes, socially just business practices, because that is important too. And then also, of course, local whenever possible. Now, I know that's not always the case, but there's so much that goes into the sustainability of a product based on its location. So something may be sustainable, but if you are shipping it overseas and it's going through that whole process, it really loses a lot of that kind of sustainability. So if you can get it local, you can get it closer to home, it's definitely much better and contributes to the healthy interior environment and exterior environment as well. The other thing about healthy environments is what type of products you're using. So choosing non-toxic, non-polluting products is really important. Chemical-free, organic, hypoallergenic paint, like yes, that's a thing. Fibers and woods that haven't been treated with pesticides. All those things do make a difference in the long run. It's stuff we breathe, it's cancer-causing, it's all these things that, you know, when we think of sustainability, so often we think of just like the world and recycling and stuff. But a lot of it goes into what we're breathing, how we're occupying a space. So it's really important to think of all those things when you're thinking about sustainability. That, yes, is a lot of control of the user. So maybe what type of detergents and cleaning products the user is using. But it also goes into us as designers and the stuff that the occupant doesn't have control over, like what kind of paint is on the wall or what type of pollutants are in the wood flooring. And so knowing those things so that you can incorporate them from the beginning so you can set your occupant up for success is super important. One of these 
big important things with the non-toxic, non-polluting products is paint. Yes, a lot of paints, I would say most paints at this point, have low VOCs. If you can find no VOCs, that's even better. VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and these lead to all sorts of health issues, including cancer and, and even just like the way you breathe. So if you can get a paint that is no VOCs, it really seriously helps you breathe better in an environment. It helps with the respiratory health. And all of that's really crucial, especially with things like COVID that affect things like respiratory health. So having an environmental, a healthy interior environment is so critical. And off-gassing of VOCs can happen with paints, not only paints, but also carpets and manufactured flooring. So all those things are super important. And you just want to make sure that, of course, you're helping out the people who you're are going to be occupying your building, right? Keeping them as healthy as possible. Okay, so the fourth way that you can make your project more sustainable today is a low environmental impact. So what does this mean? Essentially, try to reduce waste as much as possible. Reuse what clients have. So if you are an interior designer, then try to work with some existing furniture, some existing artwork. Not everything has to be new. You can repurpose things, you can refinish them, uh, you can reuse them in just a different way that not only saves money, but it also reduces your impact on the environment. For architects, this is really important if you're doing a remodel or something. Instead of just scrapping the house, tearing it all down and starting new, see what you can do with the existing. Get creative, get get Tetrisy and try to make do with what is existing and then add on and and morph as needed, but try to reuse what you can. Things like shopping vintage and if you're an interior designer and then again making products or finding products using recycled materials whether that's incorporating insulation made of old denim or roofing that uses old tires or something. I don't know. Get creative with it. There's tons of ways that you can look into this. There's so many companies nowadays that are incorporating stuff like this so it's much easier to do. So just to recap, the four ways that you can make your project more sustainable today, if you're an architect, an interior designer, or even a homeowner looking to do this is efficiency, longevity, healthy environments, and low environmental impact. So let me know, what do you think? What are the easiest things that you could incorporate today? And do you already incorporate some of these? I'd also love to hear some maybe alternative like environmental impact materials that people have used because I'm always looking to find out more. Clients are asking and more curious now than ever to make their projects more sustainable. So having that knowledge is really important. So let me know what you think. I'd love to hear it in the comments over on YouTube or DM me on Instagram at Design. And I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, four ways to make your project more sustainable. Go out there, help make our world a little bit healthier. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.